Okay, who wants to go to heaven? Raise your hand. All right. Who wants to be a saint? Raise your hand. I don't see all hands up. All right, I got news for you, folks. Guess what? You don't get into heaven unless you become a saint, either in this life or the next. Okay, uh, tomorrow is Monday, uh, November 1st. It is the Feast of All Saints. But then there's this other feast. The next day, the following day, Tuesday, is the Feast of All Souls. So it's like a reminder to us every year, these back-to-back -back feasts, uh, that not everybody slides into heaven on a bobsled, eating a bag of chips, all right? And uh, we have this doctrine called purgatory that I want to preach on. I promised I would preach on it in my flock note that went out this week to the parish. I said I was going to preach on it. I want everybody to have a good doctrinal understanding of purgatory because it's central to an understanding of the Catholic thing, the Catholic understanding of salvation, Catholic understanding of grace, the Catholic understanding of what our Lord did on that cross, his death and resurrection. Uh, what did it merit for us? Uh, so I want to get into that a little bit, starting with the book of Revelation. Let's look at heaven for a second. And we see there that uh, only the saints are in heaven. There's no other way in than to be whole, complete, sanctus, holy, uh, healed, 100% uh, through and through, inside and out. Uh, that's what God's ultimately trying to accomplish. That is the fullness of salvation. That is the completed work of the grace of Christ. When uh, each of us is fully alive in the kingdom of God, where he is all in all. So what does it look like in heaven? Well, one person got to see it and reported back, given a special mystic revelation, namely John, the beloved disciple, the apostle. And he describes here that uh, there shall be no more night in heaven and there's nothing unclean or profane or common in heaven. Uh, there is uh, no abomination Literally, the Greek word is things that emit a foul stench, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and there's no falsehood. And there's nothing accursed. Only those who have washed their robes have a right to eat of this tree of life and to exist in heaven. They're the only ones who can stand it. Um, so look, um... We got to press into this and understand a key distinction between Catholicism and Protestantism on this point of uh, salvation. So for Catholics, uh, we see it's a very complex thing, salvation. It's not as simple as uh, coming up, surrendering your life to Jesus, and you're saved, and that's it. A one-time act. Uh, we don't even believe that about baptism, necessarily. Baptism is that moment. Where we are justified, and yes, we're saved, we were saved, and we're being saved, and we will be saved. Okay? It's a very complicated thing. And scripture uses a lot of language to describe this process and all sorts of terminology where your head will spin. But let's get to the essence of it, because purgatory relates uh, to our understanding of salvation, which is fundamentally different from Protestantism. Okay, we'll go and use Martin Luther uh, to help us here, an analogy that he used to describe salvation. He said, we're all dung heaps. The Protestant doctrine of total depravity is not a Catholic doctrine. Uh, we don't use that language of total depravity. Uh, we use the word of deprived. We are in a deprived or wounded state. Our nature is not entirely broken. Uh, it sounds very humble to think of us as just, you know, to just say, hey, we're all piles of dung. That was uh, Martin Luther's analogy. Every single one of us, we're all piles of dung. Okay, that's the nice way to put it. And 
And we will be so for all eternity. How do we get into heaven? Sheer act of God's forgiveness. And this forgiveness earned for us by Christ on Calvary will cover that dung heap like snow. Externally imputed a covering, covering us externally. That's the key. Inside, we remain dung heaps for all eternity. The Catholic understanding is very different. For us, salvation is an inside job, and I would say that harmonizes with the whole of the teaching of sacred scripture. We are made to be temples of God. He's going to dwell on the inside of us for all eternity. We were made to be temples. God's not going to dwell in a pile of dung. I mean, it sounds very humble, self-effacing, just, you know, we're just piles of dung, we're just piles of dung. There's something that seems so humble about that. And, but what gives greater glory to God is going inside that pile of dung. I shouldn't even use that analogy because I don't think we're piles of dung. Okay, but he goes inside of us and heals all this filth. There is filth and it produces a foul stench. Certainly uh, falsehood and abominations, idolatry. That's what it ultimately all adds up to. All those words, things that are profane or common or unclean, things that are accursed, things that are anathema, things that are abominations and falsehoods all relates to the fundamental sin of the whole human race, the whole of salvation history, ultimately all sin and some way, shape, manner, or form relates to the sin of idolatry, the great sin. Okay. Worshiping the creature instead of the creator. Turning our hearts away from our creator towards created goods. Because nothing in the created order is evil in and of itself, St. Paul says. Uh, everything is clean. Okay. Uh, what produces the stench then is our hearts. It's a moral stench. When we worship and serve ourselves or created goods instead of God, when our heart isn't completely converted to Almighty God, it produces a foul stench. And it's just com completely incompatible with the life of heaven uh, to carry that into heaven. So it's not simply about forgiveness. Catholics believe that that's, that grace of God goes inside of us and heals us. From the inside out. God is more physician than judge. I would argue. From my understanding. My reading of sacred scripture. Yes God is a judge. I'm not saying we shouldn't think about it that way. And use courtroom analogy. Sure. Uh, but it's more than that. It's not just canceling our debts. And forgiving us in that sense. Uh, he is a doctor. We go to the doctor's office. And he prescribes remedies for us our life as we work out our salvation in fear and trembling the grace of christ works in us yes he won for us the possibility the chance he opened the doors of heaven to us and saved us from eternal damnation on the cross but he also merited for us this huge reservoir of grace that we ought to avail ourselves and he established these things called sacraments, which are channels of grace into our lives. All the means at our disposal of sanctifying grace uh, were given to us by Christ, merited for us and given to us, and they meant, are meant to heal us ultimately on the inside. Cleanse our inordinate attachments, our disordered desires, convert our hearts, turn us towards Almighty God. Now, I want to look at one scripture passage that's very important for an understanding of the doctrine of purgatory. Let's look at St. Paul. There's lots of scripture passages we can look at. Just don't have time in a homily to go through them all. But this is a good one to explain it. So, St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about the day, capital D. We call this the particular judgment the moment we die, we transition to another domain and we encounter Christ. We stand in the presence of Almighty God and we experience 
a kind of review of our life. We see this corroborated by the experience of many people who've had near-death experience. And this is what they describe oftentimes. They encounter God and they go through their life and see it moment by moment. Almost like as one priest who had a near-death experience, uh, this priest in Virginia, Diocese of Arlington, I've listened to his uh, testimony many times. He said it was like, uh, for him, it was like the ghost of Christmas past or something, you know, in the Christmas carol. Uh, that's what it felt like for him. Going through his life, with total clarity, and seeing it in the light of truth. So we have a life review before Almighty God. We call this our particular judgment on the day, St. Paul says, capital D. And the work of our life is going to be tested, St. Paul says. Let each man take care how he builds upon this foundation of our lives. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Should be the foundation of our lives that, lives that we build our life on. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, each man's work will become manifest. For the day, capital D, will disclose it because it will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Fire is the love of God. When we stand before him who is the truth, capital T, Okay, And it's not like we're not going to have imperfections. I mean, goodness gracious, St. John Paul II's in heaven. He was canonized and he went to confession every week. Talk to any of the saints. They all had character defects, imperfections. It's not like we're going to be perfect walking around. Okay, look, somebody who's canonized, uh, the church, by saying they're canonized, we're not saying that they are going to be released into heaven the moment the church promulgates this, you know, or teaches this, declares they're a saint. And then suddenly they're released, the gates are open and they go in. No, after a long period of discernment of the whole church, ultimately, as they, the church sees, as the hierarchy sees a, a devotion spreading to this individual, and there has to be clear miracles that are scrutinized. It's a long, tedious process. It takes generations sometimes takes a lot of money too so if you want to become canonized you better start saving up uh, look I was with a priest when I was in Rome for a year he in his house I was living in this international house he was from Croatia this Monsignor and he was the third priest who was in Rome arguing this cause of a Croatian bishop who was martyred under the communism and I'll tell you there's a devil a devil's advocate that's like his corollary, you know, and <clears throat> whose job it was to disprove that this guy was a saint in any way possible, constantly trying to undermine this Monsignor and all the other previous priests work. Uh, it's really difficult to be canonized, a uh, tedious, long process. But the church has this power of discernment, the whole church, to say someone is in heaven. That's all we're saying. We don't release. We're just saying that they are, in fact, in heaven. They are Sanctus. St. John Paul II was Sanctus. Is Sanctus. Is in heaven. Now we have that confidence. And we have that hope. And we can offer prayers to these individuals. But they were sinners right up to five minutes after they were dead. I know St. Louis de Montfort famously said. His last dying words. Finally I won't sin anymore. <laughs> and then. He crossed into eternity. You know, we're sinners. So they have imperfections. Don't think, oh man, I'm never going to get to heaven. Uh, when our heart is ordered towards Almighty God, fundamentally, we are really, really love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. And our neighbor as ourself, our life is rightly ordered towards God. What happens to us? We receive a reward immediately. Entrance into heaven. This is what St. Paul says. After this test by fire to determine what sort of work, the quality of the workmanship of our life, each one has done. If the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, 
this trial by fire, he will receive a reward, namely entrance into the presence of an all holy God. God is a devouring, consuming fire. We don't realize what that's going to be like to be in the presence of this being. The awesomeness of that. The only ones that are going to get there are the ones that understand that want God above all and have rid their hearts of idolatry, which is falsehood and vanity. Vanus, vanish, nothing there. We want God. We have an appetite for God. Now, some people's life's gonna, work is going to burn up, St. Paul says. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Suffer loss. Loss of what? I would argue the loss of the beatific vision. The presence of God. They're not ready for the full presence of God yet. They're not able to withstand it. And I think they're going to know it too. And they're going to know. I am not ready for this. I think we will willingly. Voluntarily. Insist upon perhaps even. Uh, some time in purgatory. We need purgation. We need purification. Both of these words come from. Latin word for fire. Purgio is a word for fire. So, yeah, the church made up this word purgatory. And you don't find that word in the Bible. But the truth of the doctrine of purgatory is in the Bible. You don't find the word trinity in the Bible either. We all profess belief as Christians in the trinity. But we use a word that we made up. Yes. So we can explain this doctrine. So we can understand and articulate it. We made up a word. Nothing wrong with that. For crying out loud, the word Bible as we use it is not found in the Bible. So look, uh, the, the truth of this doctrine is there. Some people's life's work is going to burn up on this day, capital D. And they will suffer loss. Though they themselves will be saved, but only as through fire. The fire of God's love. And I would say the fire of their own love. Because we're dim bulbs down here. That bulb burns pretty dim between our ears. We got real fog on the brain. Our little peanut brains, you know, we don't really desire God that much, very half-heartedly. Oh, we think of God like, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, an old man with a white beard, a little cracked on religion with a Bible on his lap, naked babies flitting around playing harps in the clouds. And it's like not somebody we really want to hang out with that much. We don't realize with our little peanut brain that this being is the source of everything true, good, and beautiful. Infinite, inexhaustible goodness, beauty, completely ravishing us and delighting us for all eternity. The only being that can fully satisfy the hunger of our hearts and quench the thirst of our hearts. Our hunger and our thirst. When we get to the other side, we're going to see... All we want is God. We're going to be consumed with passion for this being. Our appetite finally awoke. Awakened in us. The chief suffering of those who are in purgatory is longing for God. Craving for God, perhaps 10,000 times stronger than a heroin addict. Just pining away for this being because they know this is the whole purpose of my being and existence. My destiny is to be in union with this being. To be in a state where this being is all in all. That is what our soul is going to long for. But we will suffer loss for a period. Can't really talk about a period of time because we're talking about something outside of time and space in eternity. It's more of a state than a place. A state of being where we won't enjoy yet. We're not ready for the fullness of the beatific vision. We will suffer that loss for a period. But we will be saved. But only as through this fire. Not only longing for God, but also contrition, sorrow for our sins. We see all the time wasted in our lives. 
We see how little we cooperated with God and his plan. As a matter of fact, perhaps sometimes we undermined it. Um, but yet there was still goodness in our heart. God saw there's room for him in our heart. There was still some love of God in our hearts. Now, this state of suffering is entirely different from those who are damned. Those who are in hell experience an entirely different kind of suffering. Two different kinds of suffering. Those who are in purgatory are not tormented by demons. They know they're saved. They have hope and full confidence now and awareness of the whole purpose of their meaning, of their being in existence. The fog is lifted. They know who they are and what their purpose is. They are there for a period to long be purged by this longing for God and sorrow for sin until they're made ready, till they're fully healed and capable of withstanding God's presence. And God loves us so much that he wants us to enjoy him fully and completely. He wants us all to be saints. He loves us that much. He will stop at nothing less than all of us becoming saints. Now, what about the damned? St. Paul talks about that. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and that temple you are. We're made to be inhabited by our creator. To be occupied, to be filled with our creator. All in all, to be temples of the living God, our creator. But... Something we have to embrace and agree to with freedom, with our free will, our free choice. We have the choice to kick God out of our temple. We call this mortal sin, death of the soul. Somebody who has thrust God out of their heart completely has destroyed, St. Paul says, the temple that we are. Acting contrary to the nature they were given by their creator. They've destroyed themselves and the temple of God that they are. Therefore, God will allow them to have what they have chosen. To be separated from God for all eternity. If that's what they want, that's what he will give them. He's not going to force himself on anybody we have to choose him some people will damn themselves for all eternity and we don't even want to imagine what that state of suffering is like worse than anything we could possibly imagine um, so let's wrap this up and just summarize that this is a doctrine of hope we see from everything we know about god if we're not convinced by now God is a savior. God is a loving God. He's trying to get as many of us into heaven as he possibly can. And he loves us so much. He wants us to be all become saints for all eternity. To be completely healed. And filled with his presence from the inside out. To be sanctus. The very name chosen by God when he came down here and walked among us. Jesus. Yeshua literally means the Lord saves.